Gary Johnson, independent for president. All right, everybody, are we ready to start? Yeah. Everybody awake? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, How's our cameraman doing? We're rolling. Okay. All right, welcome to the Port Wyoming Historical Society Museum. We love the fact that we have a big group today. That's really uh, nice. Uh, Nice reflection of Larry's efforts in bringing uh, the distinguished speakers to us here. So for that matter, thank you very much. I want to recognize a couple of VIPs. Our cameraman is the uh, former mayor of Port Wyoming, John Sharkey. Steve Stocks is in the uh, audience. He is the longest serving Oxnard Union High School District trustee for the education there at Oxnard. Uh, my name is Stephen Gama. I'm a volunteer here at the Port Wyoming Museum. And today we get to introduce to you Jim Kozinski. And what's really cool about Jim, um, his career was in broadcasting and construction. All right, so you're wondering what does a guy who worked in broadcasting and construction do in here to speak about the maritime history of Ventura County? Well, about 15 years ago, he started volunteering at the museum across over there at Channel Islands Harbor. So now, in addition to his other attributes, he's now an expert on Ventura County maritime uh, history. Sorry about my phone. You might all want to turn your phones off. Like me, mine is off. Anyway, so um, Jim is going to take you through four centuries of Ventura County maritime history. And he is going to stimulate us with all his knowledge that he's learned as a volunteer over across the harbor. Right? Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you. Well, when talking about maritime history, I'd like to start at the, uh, at the beginning. And so we will start with our area's earliest uh, our earliest sailors for thousands of years, the ocean was the highway for the native people living along these shores. And some were quite good at building boats. The Chumash of our region, the Tongva further south, the Macaw people of the Pacific Northwest, they were especially good at building boats capable of traveling some distance offshore. The Macaw even used sails. And interestingly, when the first Europeans arrived up there in the Pacific Northwest in the 1700s, they found the Macaw were already in possession of metal tools, chisels, knives, and such. Where did they come from? Well, later research showed the Macaw got these tools off of Japanese fishing junks, caught in storms, blown across the Pacific, going as far back as 100 AD. We will never know how many of these Japanese fishermen were rescued or enslaved by the Macaw, but many wrecks have been documented. In uh, around 1815, they saw a Japanese junk adrift off of the coast of Santa Barbara. And then in the 1840s, a U.S. Navy ship rescued uh, Japanese sailors uh, who had been blown across the Pacific and wrecked on the beach cleared on in Mexico. Well, the stories of these unlucky sailors went unrecorded until later when uh, historians and missionaries began writing oral histories. The, um, in the mid-1500s, early 1600s, explorers um, Juan Cabrillo, Sir Francis Drake, Sebastian Viscano documented their contact with the native people here on the Pacific Coast. And the first one to do so was Juan Cabrillo. He was an excellent mariner. He commanded his ship San Salvador right up our channel. He left from Barra de Navidad, 20 miles north of Manzanillo, Mexico, and he sailed some 2,200 miles, all the way up the coast to present-day Jenner by the mouth of the Russian River. He named geographical points, and he claimed all of this land for Spain. But the uh, Spanish crown didn't attempt to settle this territory for well over 200 years. In fact, it wasn't until uh, Spain got wind of Russian fur traders slowly making their way down the coast 
hunting the sea otter. And uh, Spain became concerned they were getting a little too close to their territory. So Spain drew upon the, the uh, uh, method of colonization that had served them so well in other places. They established the mission system. And starting with San Diego in uh, 1769. And this was around the time the Portola expedition then went up and discovered San Francisco Bay. And uh, by now, the uh, Franciscan Padres, they were uh, anxious to come up here to Alta California and uh, convert the native people to the uh, Catholic faith. Now, the missions were never self-supporting. They were dependent on supply ships from Mexico and South America to bring them what they needed. But in 1810, Mexico began its war of independence, and the supply ships stopped coming. So now, the Padres had to become more self-sufficient. They had to become businessmen. And they were already raising cattle, so they began trading the, cat, the uh, hides and the tallow with the passing ships. One of the ships they traded with was a uh, brig out of Boston called the Pilgrim. Now aboard the Pilgrim was a young sailor named Richard Henry Dana. And uh, he became quite famous later. He uh, wrote his um, well-known book, Two Years Before the Mass. The book has never been out of print. And uh, Dana Point is named for Richard Henry Dana. Well, in 1822, Mexico won its war of independence. And one of the first things it did was to confiscate all the mission land and it reduced the missions to parish churches. And this, uh, and then it began giving out enormous land grants. And this had the effect of carving California up into this patchwork quilt of, uh, of, uh, of land grants, eight, 10,000 acres, huge. The um, Olivas Adobe in Ventura is the ranch house for uh, the uh, Rancho San Miguel. Well, for the next 25 years or so, things are fairly peaceful here in uh, Alta, California. It was the period of the Californios, California under Mexican rule. Now, we did have a war with Mexico, 1846, 1848, but um, it didn't have that much of an impact on those living up here. However, two events would occur that would have an impact, and one was the uh, end of the war, and the other was the uh, discovery of gold. And these two events occurred only a week apart in 1848. The peace treaty with Mexico gave the United States all of this new territory. And the um, gold rush, well, that resulted in the largest migration of young men in history. At the time, San Francisco was a sleepy outpost called Yerba Buena. Most years, only eight or ten ships dropped anchor there. But by spring of 1849, hundreds of ships were bringing thousands of would-be gold seekers through the Golden Gate. Now some of them arrived um, via the Isthmus of Panama route. This was a shorter, faster way to get to the gold fields. It was also more expensive and it ran a high risk of uh, catching malaria. The passengers would come on a ship uh, from either the East Coast or down in New Orleans, and they were dropped off on the east side of Panama. And then they would walk or ride the 60 swampy miles across the isthmus and hope to catch a steamer heading north. Like, I don't know if you can see that, one of these, uh, one of these guys here, ah, there you go. You see a steamer back here. Most of those who arrived by um, ship, however, came on the um, clipper ship. That's this one here. 
The Clipper was truly the high uh, watermark of sailing technology. And until steam became firmly established in the late 1800s, the Clipper ship was the gold standard for speed and dependability. The Clipper ships were built for the tea trade. They were long and narrow, and they were fast. They, were, they clipped right along. When the word of the gold discovery reached the East Coast, these Clipper ships found a brand new purpose. The best ones filled very quickly. But the demand to reach California was so great that uh, all kinds of vessels, even those long past their prime and ready for the breaker's yard, were pressed into service. Now this voyage took them around the very dangerous Cape Horn of South America. There you see the, difference, uh, the two different routes. Um, the long route was 13,000 miles. On average, it took four months. Upon reaching San Francisco, many of these ships were abandoned by the crew where they themselves headed off to the gold fields. And then later, many of these vessels were uh, broken up and their timbers were used to build the new town. We have some wonderful models of clipper ships at the Channel Islands Maritime Museum. And you know, I would be remiss if I didn't give a quick plug for our sponsor. <laughs> We are a maritime art museum. We have maritime art dating back over 400 years. Original dust masters art. We are also the home for the very famous Edward Marple models. Among modelers, Edward Marple was a legend. We also have new paintings as well. So we invite you to come out and join us. We are next, I, I always forget the address, so forgive me here. We are next to the old Whale's Tail restaurant. Uh, we used to be called the Port Royal restaurant. That's where our building is located. We are open five days a week from um, 10 until 4. We're closed on Tuesdays and Wednesdays for our education program. Well, not everyone sought their fortune in gold because the Pacific Northwest was rich with timber. And even before the gold rush, lumber conglomerates had been mining the forests up around uh, the Puget Sound and Oregon and the Northern California counties, Sonoma, Mendocino, Humboldt. There were few roads in those days, and so dog hole ports were the best way to get the timber out of the forest and to the swamp. And a dog hole port used to be right here. The dog hole ports, the sawmills, were built in these craggy little rocky indentations uh, along the coast. And there was always the danger of hidden rocks and shallow reefs, uh, dangerous undertows. The life of the lumber schooner man was as dangerous, if not more so, than those hauling explosives. One captain wrote in his journal, that the greatest danger to the sailing ship here on the west coast were the uh, northwesterlies and the southeasterlies and the southwesterlies. <laughs> uh, the first sawmill uh, went in near Bodega Bay about 1843 and over time there would be over 400 of them operating on what came to be known as the sawdust frontier. Now it took a lot of skill to work a uh, ship into one of those little dangerous dog hole ports and it didn't take long for the lumber companies to realize that the square rig ship, the workhorse of the merchant fleet, was not cut out for this kind of work. It, it was too big. It was hard to load and required too large of a crew. And so for this reason, a unique vessel was born. It was the California Lumber Schooner. It only needed four or five men to operate it and to load it. And later when steam arrived, these ocean-going tea kettles, as they came to be called, could be seen hauling lumber up and down the coast all the way to South America. Up in um, Puget Sound, they were loading as many as 52 in a day. Well, because roads didn't develop here in our area until the late 1800s, in order to build uh, cities like San, Fran 
San Buenaventura, the building supplies had to be brought in from the sea. Lumber schooners, very similar to this one, would drop anchor in the bay. The lumber was lowered over the side into rafts, teams of horses on the shore would pull the rafts uh, uh, up to the beach. Three of these schooners wrecked on Ventura's beaches. The Crimea came ashore right where the Pier Pond Inn stands today. And uh, the city fathers at the time named three streets, which still bear the name, you drive up Thompson Boulevard and you will pass the Crimea, the Ann, and Calorac. Well, our Pacific Coast story wouldn't be complete unless we said something about whaling. Whaling played an important role in California's early economy. Um, whaling ships from all around the world, Nantucket and elsewhere, uh, dropped anchor in San Francisco Bay. They hunted whale uh, all the way up to Alaska, down the Baja, far out into the Pacific. They hunted all species of whale, but the one they wanted most was the big sperm whale. Because a large one could yield about 500 gallons, or nine barrels, of high-grade oil. Average whaling ship could carry about 2,000 barrels. And it wasn't only the oil. Uh, the oil was used for lighting and um, lubrication and medicine. Uh, but it was also about the baleen. The baleen was used for many of the things we now use plastic for. Um, uh, buttons and uh, collars, stays and corsets and whatnot. Unlike a merchant ship, the whaling ships, like you see here, uh, the merchant ships would take their cargo to a location and drop it off, and then the, they would return home with another load. But the whaling ships couldn't return home until they had harvested enough oil to make their voyage profitable. And as the whales became more scarce, the ships were going further and further out, and sometimes these voyages took two, even three years, and this caused a terrible strain on marriages. So that by 1830, uh, many wives of whaling captains were insisting that they not be left behind, often taking the entire family and um, sometimes even taking command some of the uh, whaling wives became excellent uh, navigators. A few of the women kept journals, and from uh, these we get a picture of what it was like for some of these women aboard the ships, uh, the whaling ships, in the day of sail. Those are the whales celebrating the uh, development of uh, uh, kerosene from petroleum. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They, uh, they hunted uh, the sea otter, and the, uh, and the sea lion was also hunted here in our channel, right out here on Anacapa and the other islands, up through the uh, early 1900s. The fishing industry in our area uh, developed in uh, 1860 when the, G the Chinese moved here. You will recall the Chinese worked on the railroad, and they also worked in the gold fields. But when those two sources of revenue played out, then the Chinese, um, many of them, went back to fishing, uh, which they were so good at. Uh, had we lived here in the 1860s, 1870s, we would have seen a number of these vessels, the Chinese junks and sampans. And they were remarkable pieces of engineering. Uh, unlike uh, American fishing boats, they used a batten type of sail, so if something tore, they only had to replace that part of it. And they also used compartmentalized hulls, so if they got a, uh, a tear, uh, a break in the hull, they could seal that uh, part off. America's Civil War began in 1861. And while we didn't have the uh, blockades and the sea battles here, as they had back east. Nonetheless, there was drama. The Union was blockading the southern ports, and so the Confederacy looked west toward our ports of San Diego and San Pedro as possible gateways to Europe. The reason they thought this might be possible is because at the time, there were uh, a lot of people here in California, Southern California especially, who were sympathetic to the Southern cause. 
There were also many Californios out here mighty unhappy that uh, Mexico lost California to the United States. Well, the Confederacy never did use these ports, of course, but there were skirmishes fought over it, and there were certainly many agitators out here stirring the pot. In one case, uh, Confederate agents armed a schooner up in San Francisco. They had plans to capture gold ships on their way to Panama. They even had letters of the mark signed by Confederate President Jefferson Davis. In another, Confederate agents uh, boarded a steamer down in Panama City. They had plans to um, uh, capture the ship once they went to sea, take it to Peru and arm it and turn it into a uh, Confederate, uh, a rebel privateer. And there was even the case where the captain of a U.S. Revenue Service vessel was going to capture his own ship. And he was going to turn it into a West Coast uh, Confederate uh, raider. Well, in all three of these cases, the authorities stepped in just in the nick of time. When the war ended in 1865, a young Thomas Bard was sent here from Pennsylvania to look for oil. His boss was a railroad tycoon named Thomas Scott, who owned much of the land that is now Ventura County. Well, what Bard found initially wasn't oil. It was the wealth of the Oxnard Plain. The oil would come later. And as Bard began selling off portions of this enormous rancho, to the settlers, he knew these farmers were going to need a wharf to get their crops to the market. Until the railroad arrived a few years later, the ocean was still the highway, just as it had been for the Chumash. Well, in 1871, Bard's Wharf was built. That was about the same time as the wharf in Ventura and the one up in Santa Barbara, Stern's Wharf. They were built within a year of one another. And Bard's Wharf was a very busy place for about five years. And then the Oxnard brothers built their sugar beet factory, where Five Points is today. The railroad ran a line over there, and now almost, now the farmers could get their crops to the market much faster and for less money. So almost overnight, the business for Bard's Wharf came to an end, and Wainimi here became somewhat of a ghost town. From a maritime perspective, uh, not a lot went on around here for the next 40 years. Certainly the West Coast ports were s slowly expanding as more people moved west. Um, lumber was still being skidded down the road there in Seattle. The dog hole ports were busy. 1914, the Panama Canal opened. That had a big impact, though many people were mighty upset about that $375 million price tag. But then closer to home in 1917, a gentleman named Fred McCloskey decided he was going to, he had a, uh, a tomato cannery business right over here by the old Bard's Wharf and he decided he was going to go into the fish cannery business. And so he submitted plans to build a harbor behind the uh, lighthouse over here in the salt flat. Sound familiar? <laughs> and he, this harbor would be large enough to accommodate 40 or 50 fishing boats. But his plans went uh, bust when uh, uh, war, the war came along, World War I, and he went bankrupt. Well, 1920, prohibition became the law of the land, and the many isolated stretches of coastline between Mendocino all the way down to Palos Verdes, excellent places for the rum runners to drop off their illegal liquor. The area between um, Ventura and San Pedro especially was known as Rum Row. The, the bootleggers would hide here behind the islands and then they would wait for the revenuers to leave and they'd sneak their Ill, illicit hooch ashore. But these were prosperous times in Ventura County, the 20s were. They were so much so that a young Richard Bard, the son of Thomas Bard, put the wheels in motion to build a county-owned deep water port here at Wainimi. But it wasn't easy. 
because you see Ventura wanted it up there. Wainimi wanted it down here for all of these reasons. I'll give you a moment to take a look at that. Um, and if, for those of you who can't, who can't read that, uh, with Ventura there'd be no room for expansion and uh, rough sea conditions here in Wainimi. Um, there was plenty of room for expansion. And if that's not enough, there is that deep water subterranean canyon just offshore. I'm showing a thousand feet. I think it's closer to 1,100 feet, but this area is not as uh, subject to swells and storms and, and surges. The, the, the Chumash people knew this. They knew this as a peaceful, restful place. Why Nimi? And this is where they launch their tamals before they begin their 10-hour row out to the islands. Well, the, the legal battles between Wainimi and Ventura waged back and forth for several years. Went all the way to Washington, D.C. But finally, the California Supreme Court ruled in favor of Wainimi, and that is why the port is where it is today. Bard tried to get the city of Ventura to annex this area into the city of Ventura, much the same as um, uh, Los Angeles did with uh, San Pedro. But Ventura wouldn't hear of it. I wonder what they do now. <laughs> well, Bard tried to get uh, federal funding, tried to get a loan, but the uh, government did not believe that the people of Ventura County needed a deep water port. So the money was raised locally with a bond. It was the first time that had happened. Uh, private funds built this uh, port. It took about a year to dredge out the port once, uh, once things began. But then, as, uh, as most of you know, Four months after the ribbon cutting, Pearl Harbor was bombed. And the Navy, with its power of eminent domain, came in and said, thank you very much, we will pay off your bond, but we will also take your point. And so uh, for the next four years, I understand about 25% of all the war supplies to the South Pacific were shipped out through the port of Wainimi. And when the war ended in 45, thousands of service personnel returned home. But it would be another three years, not until 1948, before the people of Ventura County got a little bit of their port back for commercial purposes. And today, the port of Wainimi is a huge economic engine for our uh, county. Uh, it's one of the uh, larger produce gateways in the country, and also uh, around 270,000 cars are imported through the port each year, and many are also uh, shipped out. In, uh, what's that? Apparently some cocaine came in. Possibly. Uh, in 2009, it became the first... Uh, uh, the port became the first literal combat ship support facility, so it plays a very important role in our nation's defense. Well, I should want to say a little something about shipwrecks. For, uh, for over 200 years, the Pacific coast from Alaska clear down to San Diego um, has seen many shipwrecks. This is a uh, cool slide we got from the San Francisco Maritime Museum. I'm not sure how well you can see it. it uh, on this side, we see uh, way up in Washington State, and it comes all the way down to uh, San Diego on the right there. And it lists um, all the shipwrecks that have occurred here on the Pacific Coast from, uh, from about 1850 to, I, I believe this was 1976, too many to count. Um, Pacific storms and bad luck, navigational errors, incompetence, all of these reasons have figured into why ships have gone on the rocks and on the uh, uh, beaches here on the Pacific coast. I'd like to tell you about some of the places that have been especially unlucky for vessels. We'll start up here at Cape Flattery, which is the northwesterly most point 
of the U.S. mainland up in the state of Washington. It should have been named Cape Tombstone because um, around Cape Flattery lie millions and millions of dollars of lost ships and, uh, and cargo. Uh, over 150 deep water vessels have come to grief around uh, Cape Flattery and the Straits of Juan de Fuca, and those are just the ones we know about. Uh, 230 miles south is the uh, graveyard of the Pacific, the Columbia River Bar. It's where the uh, mighty Columbia River, like water from a fire hose, collides with the Pacific Ocean, creating the worst wave conditions on the planet. If you have ever been up to Astoria, Oregon, when even a mild storm rolls in, you will appreciate the challenges crossing the bar up there. Uh, according to mu the um, museum, over fifth up there, over 1,500 vessels and 2,000 uh, lives, or the other way around, uh, 2,000 vessels and 1,500 lives have been lost crossing the Columbia River bar. A little closer to home, over 40 ships have met their end up there on the rocky beaches of the Big Sur coastline. Closer still, in one of the Navy's largest peacetime disasters, uh, 1923, seven U.S. destroyers met their end there on the jagged rocks of Point Honda. It was due to a navigational error. Um, that's now up at the Vandenberg, that's now part of Vandenberg Air Force Base, Point Honda. Oh, well, closer to home. Were they in fog or? Uh, that, no, it wasn't necessarily fog. It was uh, the uh, it was when uh, radio directional finding was in its infancy, and the uh, commodore of the squadron they were making a high speed run, and the commodore of the squadron um, was told they were making their port turn too soon. Uh, radio directional finders told him they were making it too soon, but he he dismissed that. And, they, and one by one, uh, fortunately not all of them followed him, but some of them did. Uh, the, um, uh, two of our shipwrecks right, right close to home, the um, steamship Winfield Scott, uh, this was 1853, and the Winfield Scott was a passenger and mail steamer making regular runs between San Francisco down to Panama. Now normally the um, ships would go around the outside of the islands here, but on this particular voyage, the captain decided to go inside and uh, to make up some lost time. And uh, it was nighttime when he got down here and it was foggy and he wrecked on that narrow gap between the north and south part of Anacapa Island. Fortunately, no one was uh, killed or injured uh, although the passengers did spend an uncomfortable night on a ledge there, and the next day everyone uh, uh, transferred over to uh, uh, a sandy area of Frenchy's Cove. Uh, there's an interesting aside to this story. As the captain and the first mate were going through the ship to um, uh, make sure everyone was off, they found two guys rifling through the luggage. And uh, so these guys were taken out, and they were arrested, and the next day they were um, uh, staked down to the beach and they were flogged. This was 1853 after all. <laughs> uh, that's the top-down view of the story. There, there, there's, there's much more to it, and it, it's an interesting read, The Wreck of the Winfield Scott. Well, even closer to home, while I'm talking about shipwrecks, I'll, I'll wrap this one up with our uh, story of the La Janelle. Um, the La Janelle started life in 1931 under the name, it was launched as the Borenguin. And for the next 40 years, it saw service uh, from the East Coast down into the uh, uh, Caribbean, uh, transporting passengers. And it had uh, several owners during that time, and it also had several names. Well, in 1969, three promoters with big ideas and a slim budget, bought the vessel. They named it La Janelle for one of their wives, and they brought this aging liner around here, and they docked it right here at the port, uh, seeking investors to turn the La Janelle 
into a, um, a hotel, restaurant, kind of like a Queen Mary. But these guys hadn't done their homework because, first of all, by then, that time, um, insurers would not insure a vessel for that purpose unless it had fire sprinklers. And also, the ship drew too much, it had, its draft was too great. It could not enter either the uh, Channel Islands or the uh, Ventura Harbor. And so, um, with no investors in sight, our um, beleaguered entrepreneurs anchored their ship about a mile and a half offshore with two uh, caretakers aboard while they were desperately seeking someone to take this off of their hands. So it swung at anchor out there for about seven months. Well, finally, uh, they found an Indonesian businessman who was looking to cut a deal, and uh, he contracted with them to take the vessel and sail at some place where they weren't so fussy about sprinkler laws. And um, uh, while, uh, while they were waiting for a new crew to show up, we had a big storm here. Uh, that was July 13th, not a Friday, but it was July 13th, uh, 1970. Well, the ship uh, drug its anchor, and it wound up on the beach. And the uh, caretakers had to be removed on, via helicopter, and it lay out there just like that for almost five years. And it was a magnet for uh, uh, all kinds of uh, scavengers, <laughs> treasure seekers. Um, and uh, a few of them got hurt, and uh, one actually drowned. And so about that time, the Coast Guard stepped in and required the, they, they cut the top off and they sunk the top out a, a few miles and it's now part of a reef. But the rest of it, they filled it with uh, rock and it's now part of the North Jetty here at the uh, museum. And uh, if you want, you can drive around there, walk up on the beach and walk right over the top of the remains of the old La Janelle. But if you don't want to do that, you can come to the Channel Islands Maritime Museum where, <laughs> where we have a, uh, a display. Every now and then someone will be cleaning out their garage and um, they will bring us some artifact that almost cost them their life. <laughs> well, we've always had superstitions, but no group harbors as many superstitions as the sailor. After all, sailors in the day of sail faced many perils. They could be capsized in a storm or lost on a desert island or stuck in the doldrums. So is it any reason that no, uh, you know, sailors had all these superstitions? Who wants to tempt fate when death is right at your elbow? Until the later 1800s, going to sea was as risky as going into space today. Here are some of the more common superstitions from that day. Whistling was strictly forbidden aboard a sailing ship. It was believed the god of wind might feel he's being mocked, and he might whistle up a storm. Flowers and clergymen were usually not welcome aboard sailing ships. This was because of their association with funerals. Saying the word pig was strictly forbidden. Even though they had livestock aboard the ships when they started on their voyages, they slaughtered them as they went across the ocean, but you could not call it a pig. And maybe this explains why in seaports all around the world to this day, you will find pubs that are called the pig and the whistle. <laughs> well, the, um, the rituals and the um, and the uh, superstitions of the sailors back in those days seem kind of humorous to us now. But try to imagine when you were on a sailing ship and you were eight or ten my, uh, day, uh, weeks from your last sighting of land, just you and your shipmates are isolated from the rest of humanity. So is there any reason that you would grasp any little bit of support you could find, whether it was real or imaginary? Well, thank you very much for uh, hearing me out this morning. Do you have any questions? Anybody have any questions? Do you ever out to sea?
your service? Uh, did you ever spend time in the Navy? Or? I did. I did. Yeah, I was aboard. Uh, I was aboard a, a ship. I was aboard an aircraft carrier, the Bonhammer Shark. The, the, the Deepwater Canyon benefit from the port I mean, it's so deep, it really doesn't help with the draft. The, the, the Deepwater Canyon has uh, benefits the port in the sense that we do not have the, the silting uh, issue here. And, and of course, the, 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 uh, the, the waters are much calmer here than they would be up in Ventura or uh, other places. Can I bring up an interesting point? Absolutely. We on that ship that came in, the Navy ship. They had to drop the anchor in the harbor last night and they were moored. And because uh, three of the lines were broken, and that was because the wind was pushing it so much from the side that it broke the lines, so they had to drop the anchor. And, I, and we asked them all, well, the port supposed to be calm? Well, it wasn't so calm last night. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything about, <clears throat> I heard there was a Japanese sub during World War II that surfaced off of Goleta? Yes. And then shot an oil well or something? Yes. It did, it did. A, a Japanese, and interestingly, the captain of that submarine, uh, he went to college here in the, uh, in the U.S. Um, and uh, I, I believe he also had family here, but yes, he surfaced off the coast of uh, Goleta and he um, he fired there. there, there you know where the um, that oil processing plant yes. is up there? Yeah, he uh, he set a shed on fire with with his three-inch gun. Trading balloons, hot air balloons and stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I'm sure you know better than I. But I always thought when there's a deep water canyon. It funnels waves and jacks them up. Like that's why Silver Strand, the waves get so much bigger there than other places. Interesting. Yeah, I I I, I don't know. Which way? That, I. So if you look at this picture up here, you can see there's no direct break water out in front of the harbor. Right. And that that's because of that canyon. Remember when Will Berg explained it to us? And so, for a wave to develop, mm. it has to hit shallowness. And that's what drives the wave. But because of, you can see right here, there's no, so, so the wave doesn't break into the harbor. It just never develops. But as you know, um, right around the corner, there'll be 15, 20 foot waves at Silver Strand Beach and on Wainini Beach. But that canyon is kind of like a narrow, narrow spot. I was curious about the Richard Barn. You were saying he wanted Ventura to annex. I'm sorry. You said Richard Bard wanted Ventura to annex the area. What was, was it just a financial type of interest? Or? Well, um, my understanding is that Ventura wanted the port up there. They would, they, right. And if they couldn't have it up there, they didn't want it, any part of it. Oh, I see. Okay. And this is why uh, Ventura is not part of the Harbor District. Well, thank you very much. I have for you a little gift for you and your wife. Well, thank you very much. He modestly didn't introduce himself. So there's a wonderful book called A Troubled Dream, written by uh, Powell Greenland. Powell Greenland, and it's a fascinating book, and it talks about all the struggles the Bard family went through. To, to get this harbor here. And um, as you read the book, I read the book, um, you get to a point where you're like, all right, all right, we're gonna finally get there. And then you get disappointed again. And that happens time and time and time again. And then it's kind of, it's funny because of World War II and then the confiscation of the harbor is like, you know, it's almost like you expected it. If you get a chance, read that book. We have a whole thing on um, the crust. We did a lot of research. I saw that. Yeah, I saw that, and there's a quite a bit of information on Jay's store about it as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, we're going to pass the hat right now. This is for uh, contributions. From Thank you very much, David. Um, these, we are we don't get any money from the city, so well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> that was a hint, hint to the council member. Uh, so, and we run on 100% volunteer power, too. 
So if you will care to give a donation, we would be really happy to receive it.